anyone has any uh, recognizes or has any thoughts about who these two men are, uh, please hold that thought. I'll get to them at the end. I'll tell you this much, though, that they were both fighters. That is, boxers, in that they studied the art of boxing for all of their adult lives, as have I. Now, boxing is not generally considered an art. It's generally regarded as a sport by most people, by some of our great champions of today. But I'm not talking about boxing as a sport, although people not only think of it as a sport, they think of it as a brutal sport. This is the image of what people think of boxing, one man beating up another. This quote captures uh, the way people think about boxing. This is an extreme though not uncommon view. Beyond the physical brutality of this pretended sport, which trains people in mutual assault, this repulsiveness lies in its opposition to every commendable concept of our civilization. I beg to differ, and over the next few minutes, I hope to convince you all that boxing is one of the highest achievements of civilization, as hard, as hard as that might be to believe. Now, there are lots of fighting arts in the world, over 400, and uh, some of them are treat, uh, viewed as purely fighting arts, but many of them have uh, deep philosophical underpinnings, and they offer everything from health benefits, psychological balance, uh, spiritual development, personal growth, self-actualization. Some of them, uh, Qigong and, and Tai Chi, have evolved entirely away from the fighting aspect, and they concentrate only on personal development. But what does boxing offer besides this perceived brutality? Let's get into the philosophy of boxing, because boxing came into existence at the very height of the Age of Enlightenment. In 1740, David Hume wrote a treatise of human nature, and about 22 years later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote the social contract. Now at the time, philosophers throughout Europe were trying to define what it meant to be a human being, and not only that, but how, how can we create a civil society? But right in the middle of that, a man named Jack Broughton wrote the first rules of modern boxing, and in it he said, no person is to hit his adversary when he is down. And he began to define what modern boxing was. It was a hundred years before the London Prize rules came into effect, and they included the rule that it shall be a fair stand-up fight. And then shortly after that, the Queensbury rules, which included the fact that no wrestling would be involved. Now these three concepts define boxing and define boxing's perception on not only what it is to be a human being, but how we create a civil society. Because in a civil society, we just don't hit a person when they're down. It just goes against everything that civil society is all about. And the fact that it's a fair stand-up fight goes back to what it means to be human. Because to be human means to stand on our own two feet. That's what makes us a noble species. And that's what makes it a noble sport. And the fact that there's no wrestling involved is because we don't, we don't restrain people and make them submit. In a civil society, we neither want to be made to submit, nor do we want to make other people make submit. We get into boxing human nature. I'm going to have a little fun with this and go back to a way that we can look at we can look at human nature in lots of different ways. And one of the ways that we look at human nature is the uh, the Myers Briggs dichotomies. Now we can. We can use these principles of energy, information, decision making, and lifestyle, and we can uh, and we can call it Briggs versus Myers to put it in a boxing context, and to even have a little more fun with it, we'll put some faces on it, because these two fighters exemplify the dichotomy. And one is Mike Tyson, the other Muhammad Ali. Now Mike Tyson deals with energy in a frenetic way, and he squanders it. He deals with information in a by picking up on the obvious, and these ideas remain static. His decision making is decisive but reckless, and his lifestyle characterized by willfulness and arrogance. On the other hand, the great Ali, whose nature as a boxer, deals with energy in a calm way and he conserves it. His information, uh, uh, the way he deals with that, is a subtle and dynamic way. He processes thoughts. His decision making is cerebral and cautious, and his lifestyle characterized 
by mindfulness and sincerity. And this is what boxing teaches. And um, you can still have all those great qualities and be the baddest man on the planet. Now the principles of the form are particularly important. This is one of the ways boxing teaches punching. You have to be grounded. Footwork is everything in boxing. Footwork is everything. If you're not grounded, you can't be balanced. But when you're grounded and balanced, that's not enough. You have to be centered. Groundedness, balance, and centeredness allows you to develop form. Now they call it kinetic linking. Boxing's known about it for a long time. And then once you're grounded, balanced, and centered, and your muscles move together with kinetic linking, and then you can move in time and have rhythm. And that's what boxing teaches. And that's what gives power to a punch. And these principles can be applied to every aspect of life. And I could give you many examples, but I'll give you just one. When you're writing an essay, it has to be grounded in truth. In Harvard, that means research and citations. You better get it right. It has to be balanced, showing all sides of an issue. It has to be centered on a particular idea. It has to have form, and all parts work together. It has to flow with the rhythm, and that's what gives an essay power. And these are the things that boxing teaches. And that's why boxing is an integral part of a civil society and deserves a place with all of the great fighting arts of the world. South African President Nelson Mandela and U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt.